class at Stanford, and uh, so the, uh, in those days, uh, uh, William Douglas uh, had uh, a former clerk, Stanley Sparrow, who was practicing in Oakland, uh, select his clerk for him. He, he never did interviews personally himself, and so uh, Stanford put me forward as a, a candidate uh, uh, for the clerkship. Uh, uh, two years before, Warren Christopher had been the uh, first Stanford Law School graduate to become a law clerk at the Supreme Court and had clerked for Douglas. So uh, uh, in any event, I, I was the one who was in the competition and uh, Stan Sparrow uh, uh, selected me and recommended that, that I be the clerk to go back for the 51 term. What did you know about Douglas before you really – the first time you met him was probably in Washington, right? That's right, because he usually spent the summer uh, uh, out in the West in Goose Prairie, and uh, uh, I didn't meet him till he came back uh, to Washington. Um, all I knew was a public persona. He was, a, you know, a Westerner, uh, a uh, presumably laid-back Westerner. But Stan Sparrow had warned me that you had to be careful of public appearance. That, in fact, that it was a hard job. He was all business uh, in the. Uh, uh, chambers when you were working with him right. across the desk and uh, a demanding person and uh, uh, that's the way it turned out to, to be. Uh, if you, you got him outside that context, he could be uh, uh, charming and amusing and uh, you know, a good person to be around, but he, he was a tough uh, boss uh, when you were working with him across the desk. Did you have much chance to inter interrelate with the other justices, and I'm leading myself to Robert Jackson and Certainly. his clerks? Uh, did, was that a, a part of the uh, esprit within the clerks to get to know the other clerks? Absolutely. It was really one of the most satisfying parts of the uh, uh, time spent back there was the relationships you developed and the friendships you developed with other clerks. Actually, uh, Bill Rehnquist uh, had been in the class behind me at Stanford, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he finished early and then came back. Uh, I had come in by the fall. He came after the first of the year in 52, uh, so our time overlapped, and we knew each other from our time together at Stanford. And uh, but I got to know the other clerks uh, early on, and uh, as I say, working together, uh, we used to eat lunch fairly regularly uh, mm -hmm. in the clerks' dining room and uh, chat. And, and there were there were other occasions when uh, there would be social events uh, that the clerks would have. So. It, it, was, uh, it was a good experience. Jackson. Uh, when I use the term Jackson, what's that mean to a Marshall Swamp? Well, I have uh, one very clear impression of uh, Justice Jackson uh, when I you know, try and search my memory uh, because I did not have much uh, uh, actual uh, uh, relationship w with him. I it did with uh, Bill Rehnquist because I'd known him. But uh, I remember very distinctly uh, uh, one birthday party they held for the justice, or his birthday, the, the term I was there, and uh, uh, the clerks were all invited to come, and uh, uh, Felix Frankfurter was the only justice who was apparently invited to come who was there, and uh, um, so we, we chatted, but as it turned out, uh, uh, Justice Frankfurter, which was his custom, tended to be a magnet and attack, uh, uh, attract young people so that the occasion ended up with a, a number of the clerks kind of in a semicircle around uh, Justice Frankfurter uh, with him firing questions back and forth and uh, the clerks responding and Justice Jackson off kind of in a corner by himself with uh, very few uh, uh, around him uh, for his birthday, but uh, that's one vivid memory I, I had. Uh, the interplay. I, I think he and uh, Justice Frankfurter uh, tended to uh, work together. Uh, mm -hmm. It was sort of my impression. Uh, <laughs> we often read about Jackson's ability in his command of the King's English. Was mm -hmm. that something that was uh, appreciated at the time that the clerks were there or the justices? That Did they comment on his writing skills, abilities, did you get any sense? My, 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 my feeling, as I recall it, and I, I, that's one feeling I've kept over the years, was that he was an excellent writer um, uh, among the justices on the court then. He was probably the best or one of the best in terms of expressing himself well. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and, and I think that was generally acknowledged, that, that he really was uh, accomplished at using the English language well. Mm -hmm. 
we're going to talk a lot, I'm sure, over the next day or two about some of the other uh, term, other cases that were about, uh, including the steel seizure case. But was there one case which sort of jumped out at you during that term that said, I remember that the most, or is that the one we'll be talking about, steel seizure? Well, there were several cases that uh, were of interest that year. Of course, the steel seizure uh, was the, uh, I think, the uh, most significant uh, the case in, in terms of constitutional law, and I felt, and I will, you know, speak later that, uh, in retrospect, uh, looking back at it, uh, that I think Justice Jackson probably had the uh, uh, most nuanced and, and the best appreciation of uh, uh, the, the complexities involved in trying to sort through uh, checks and balances and separation of powers uh, in those kinds of situations. Uh, it was not nearly uh, as simplistic approach as uh, Justice Black took uh, in the majority opinion. And uh, in that sense, I, I, th I think if you look back at it in the span of history, that uh, uh, Justice Jackson had a, uh, I think, a, a really a, a good appreciation for the, the issues and that they were complex and you, you, they weren't susceptible of simply easy uh, solutions.